Yeah, and first of all, can you just start with the injury update? I know Stephen missed the game last weekend. Will he be all right for this one? Uh, we'll see. He's uh, he, at his first session today with the team and uh, he'll train tomorrow and then uh, we'll make a decision then. But at least he's back out there and training. Everyone else okay, yeah? Uh, just trying to think. Yeah, after last week, everyone got through last week uh, fine. Um, Rayo's okay, but I think this game uh, will probably will give him another week uh, Particularly with the artificial surface, we're just thinking that it's probably best he uh, has another week of training and available for next week. Touching on that artificial surface, Kilmarnock on Sunday is a new ground for you, a new ground for a lot of the players. And how much do you need to change your, your approach when it is that artificial surface as, as well? Not really. I mean, you know, we, we obviously you know we played at Livingston last year, and um, yeah, from our perspective, it's just about making sure we prepare well and understand the you know the the challenges that. The surface may uh, present to us, and again, overcoming that challenge just by sticking to our principles, as we did last year. As I said, when we went to to Livingston, um, you know, we had a you know, strong second game after a disappointing first one. So, um, no change to our approach. Just a, obviously an awareness that there's a bit of a challenge there. It's going to be a hectic schedule coming up, and you know, not not too long. But at the moment, you've got these kind of weeks in between the domestic games to to plan and prepare. Just how beneficial is that at the moment in these early stages of the campaign? Oh, again, I think I said last week it's beneficial if you use it well. If not, um, then you know it doesn't really help because you know if you were playing games during this period, you'd, you'd probably be at match sharpness and, and match fitness as well. So it's a, it's a balance between both. Uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that we're using this time as effectively as we can. Main focus is you know continuing sort of the physical conditioning of players. So so trainings are, are very intense and have a, a real physical load, but also just working on our game, you know, working on our game model. And because as you said, uh, once the games start, uh, we're not gonna have a lot of time on the training track. And um, yeah, this is the opportunity for us to, to keep working on our football. I saw earlier on this week, there have been a couple of big clubs down south linked with Josip Juranovic. Just how impressed have you been with the way he's, you know, come into the team over the last year, and, and the way he's playing for you. Yeah, yeah, Josip's uh, fit in really well, and, and you know he had a, he had a strong season for us last year, and um, you know, like the rest of the group, has come back this year looking to be better, and that's that's our job to make sure that we keep improving these guys and challenging them, and uh, and Josip is one of those players. He's got a big year ahead of him, obviously. Um, you know, he's got a World Cup to look forward to as well. So <clears throat> I know he's very, very motivated to do well for this football club. And uh, like I said, my role is to, to make sure that we keep pushing these guys to be the best they can be. A couple of newspaper reports this week um, linked to you with um, Alex Collado of um, Barcelona and uh, Bamba Dieng of Marseille. Um, you might not want to say too, too much about that, but I was just wondering whether um, those are players who are on your radar. Um, and even if you don't want to say anything about individual players, I was just wondering, because of both strikers, whether you know, the striking position is some an area that you particularly want to strengthen. Yeah, neither are on my radar. And um, you know, as I said before, we'll stay active in the market. Um, you know, there's still a couple of weeks on uh, in terms of um, the transfer window being open. You know, where there's a possibility of still some guys to move out, and and then, you know, from my perspective, it's about finding the right fit for what we need at the moment. So, as I said, we're, we're staying active. If the right sort of individual comes along, then, um, you know, we'll 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 do our work then and move on them. But at the moment, we're talking to nobody, and uh, there's no one on the horizon. Okay, thanks. And um, again, newspaper. A uh, report suggested that uh, John Kennedy is um, of interest to the Danish club in Midtjylland. Um, I was just wondering, you know, uh, talking to John, whether he's someone who has ambitions to be a manager in his own right, and do you think it would be a, a matter of time before he, he takes that step? Yeah, I think uh, your best place to ask John about that, not me. Um, but, uh, you know, from my perspective, um, I don't read the newspapers, so I'll excuse me if I'm not up to speed with uh, what the latest news is. But um, uh, from you know John's perspective, he's had a yeah he's had a fantastic um, sort of um, managerial journey so far in terms of gaining experience and knowledge. He's worked with some 
fantastic uh, managers, me aside, and uh, you know he's, he's built up his expertise through different areas of the game because I mean he, he started off, you know, at the junior ranks and has done some scouting. He's done, you know, he's tried to make sure that he's as well rounded as he possibly can now. You know, he's he's no different to everyone, anyone else at this football club, I guess, a player or, or staff. If if you know people identify him as someone who um, they think can help their organisation, then you know it's up to the, the individuals then to, to sort of make those decisions. But yeah, John's a really important part of what we do here. Um, you know, he's an important part of my setup. Uh, he he leads a lot of the areas uh, uh, with respect to to our football. So um, you know, he's a valuable asset to to this club. Angie, how much are you looking forward to kind of putting your wits against Derek McInnes? So obviously a very experienced manager, tactically astute as well. Is that a kind of good to kind of face a new opponent as well? Yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, Derek, uh, you know, did a fantastic job last year. You know, Kilmarnock when he took over, and um, yeah, the, it was pretty. Yeah, it was pretty clear that that their ambitions were to get promoted, and and you know he, he did do that with them. And as you said, he's got great experience and. Uh, yeah, looking forward to, to meeting him and uh, and uh, you know playing against his side. Uh, so from that perspective, um, yeah, looking forward to it. Can I just ask as well, obviously you've, you've taken the squad and yourself to the, the funeral of you know John Hughes today. Was that a fitting tribute? Obviously the players as well get to see how much the club means to to the players who played for them, how much the, the players have put into their lives into to playing for Celtic as well. Yeah, no, it was it was a it was a fitting tribute and. Um, you know, to one of the legends of this football club. And yeah, I, I thought it was really, um, you know, it was a nice service and, you know, everyone spoke really well. And I thought particularly his, his youngest son spoke very well because it's not just about the footballer, it's about the man as well. And, you know, that's the bit sometimes we forget, you know, and when they talk about him as a father or a grandfather and great-grandfather, I think, um, you understand it's it's not just the footballer that you kind of revere and, and, and acknowledge, it's the man. And uh, he was, um, you know, Celtic through and through. Um, and, uh, yeah, look, I think it's important we're there. We have our presence there, the current uh, group, because... Uh, Again, uh, you know, I've said before, we, we stand on their shoulders, whatever lofty heights we reach. Um, wouldn't be We wouldn't be able to do it without the likes of, um, of John. Hi, Ange. Um, we just had Matt O'Reilly in there, and he was saying with a full pre-season under his belt, it's the, it's the best he's ever f- felt physically and as a player. So what sort of change have you seen in him and what sort of impact are you hoping he can have this season? Yeah, look, I think it's it's benefited, mate, as it's benefited a lot of our players who, who sort of last year were thrown in at different times um, to have a pre-season with us and, and to, to be able sort of to work um, the whole group as a collective uh, around our football. And, um, you know, Matt's like the other guys, as I said before about Yossip, you know, they've come back and they want to be better than they were last year and they want to improve. and. That's exactly what I want to see um, because my role then is to facilitate that. Um, you know, I think as a manager, that's what you, you're looking for constantly. You're looking for players who are hungry to be better, want to learn, and, and you know, want to take their football to another level. And um, you know, Matt and, and the rest of the boys, that's that's the attitude they've come with. And uh, you know, they'll they'll be the beneficiaries of it. I mean, ultimately, our football club will, will benefit hopefully with with success, but. Yeah, for themselves, if they can get uh, constant improvement out of their football career, uh, and every year they play, then they're going to have you know, some some pretty decent careers. And um, yeah, Matt's been really good in, in that respect. You talked about looking to bulk up the squad if you can um, for the end of the window. Is there any areas in particular you're looking at, and just how important is having a that squad depth going to be in a Champions League and World Cup year? Yeah, no, I mean. Squad depth is the key for us this year in terms of our recruiting. Uh, when you look at, you know, we kind of obviously did a lot of business last year and sort of tried to build a, a strong foundation. Um, as I said, signing Cameron and Jota was probably the most, or well, the key part of our you know, transfer policy this year to make them permanent because we felt that, you know, they would improve us this year and because they're going to improve. Um, and then after that, it was about filling the gaps that I thought existed last year. Um, you know, we got stretched as a as a group, and there was some areas where we just were really light on in terms of players. And you know, our strategy has been to to try and strengthen the the, the squad. Um, you know, in those areas, and I think we've done that for the most part. 
there might be one or two areas, but I think for me more important than sort of specific positions is just the right fit, another player who can <coughs> maybe play a couple of positions and, and, and help us through our schedule and also be a, be a contributor at different levels. So um, that's kind of what we're looking for. I think the main areas of, of sort of where there were gaps, I think we've we've filled so far. Um, so now it's just about if the right sort of player comes along that we think is a, not just a short term, but a long term fit, then we'll, we'll move for it. Hi, Ange, hope you're well. Um, you've got so many options to choose from at the moment in your squad, but only one game per week at the moment. What are the challenges for you in that? And, and also, do individual moments like Lee Alabada's goal last week play into your thinking? No challenges for me. The challenges is, is you know, for the players to, to continue to sort of train every day and and keep the performance levels high every time they play so that you know when the inevitable comes and the inevitable is an opportunity that they're ready to take it so um yeah at the moment as i said our training levels have been really good uh, really high standard very competitive very intense because as you said we've only got a game a week which means some players aren't playing um so they're to compensate for that they've got to work harder training and and like i said the inevitability is that they will get an opportunity and you know that opportunity could come in a champions league game and and what they've got to know is that they're prepared for that um, no point sort of getting that opportunity and saying well you know i haven't really didn't think i was going to play so um i wasn't ready for it so the players are well aware of that and, and to be honest their attitude's been first rate in terms of you know like i said making sure our training is really competitive that they're ready to go um, you know, we're, we've organised a couple of bounce games we've had already um, during the week, and you know the indicators there are that everyone's ready to go, and that's that's all I that's all I really need to see, and and um, because I know that um, before long they'll all be called on at some point, and uh, then it's up to them to perform. In terms of individual moments, I mean they don't really play a part because you know sometimes. Yeah, you know, when you focus on just individual uh, moments, you disregard the, the collective. And uh, you know, a lot of players who maybe um, have good individual moments are on the back of other people doing hard work. Um, so you got to factor it all in. Um, uh, to me, what I look at is the performance as a whole, and then within that, you know, if, if players have done well with, through their individual work, that's that's great for us. But again, I think they'll be the first to acknowledge that that only happens because of the collective work of, of everyone and. You know, I, I get that people sort of really fascinated by team selection and, and, you know, the 11 that starts, but, you know, I just think football is becoming more and more of a, a game of the collective and, you know, I, I, I rarely look beyond just saying, well, these are the guys we're starting with, but, you know, just as important is the guys we're going to finish with in a game. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was you seem fairly adept at blocking out external noise and almost making sure that the players don't don't feel that. Is that the case, and and how do you go about doing that? Yeah, look, I, I, I I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, I in terms of me, you know, it's not like I, I walk around sort of with a, you know, the Maxwell Smart kind of silence on me that I can't hear or talk to anyone else you know I, I need to be intuitive as to what people are thinking around the place and and uh, you know whether that's outside sort of our organization um, you know what our fans think what what the media may think what other you know coaches or, 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 or teams may think about us I think it's important it's all information do I does does that affect my sort of mindset or what I think not not really because ultimately what's really important is you know the group that are before me and, and what we say and the way we kind of conduct ourselves and um, you know what you find is that when there's a sort of singular focus and you know people then understand that the real important communication channels are the ones that they see and hear on a daily basis within the four walls rather than sort of what's outside but you know, like I said, it's not like I, I, I'm not aware of what others are saying or what others may be thinking. Um, it's more a discipline to just worry about, not worry about, but focusing on, you know, you know what the key sort of strategies are for us in, in, you know, what's the next challenge? The next challenge for us is, you know, Kilmarnock on, on, on Sunday. Anything else is just not really that important.